And now, um, up for the next topic. Um, the Dutch National Bank and the Dutch regulator are meeting FinTech and they're going to discuss innovation, regulatory enablement and open finance. So Ernst Jan Stokvis is going to host this event and I see him over there. Ernst Jan. Here you go. Um, you're going to moderate uh, the next um, round table. They're setting it up for you. So um, uh, we have to wait uh, a few moments, I guess. Uh, is your whole panel here? Yeah? Yes. Everybody here? Okay, good. Then um, I think I'll let you introduce your own panel. And um, good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, okay. Yes. Hello. And we've got anything I open. Okay, thank you. Um, let me briefly introduce myself. I am uh, Ernst Stockvis. I am an academic doing my professional doctorate in Prague about innovation and strategy. My thesis uh, is about um, learning how to transform into a digital twin. So thinking about simulations or business models instead of old thinking of um, exploitation, exploration. That's my, my topic of uh, my dissertation. Enough about me, let me uh, introduce the panel. Uh, hopefully you can uh, briefly introduce uh, yourself. And also uh, later we want to discuss uh, the definition of uh, open finance. Come and ask the panel after they introduce themselves uh, very quickly. Um, that's we're going to have discussions later. Um, we have prepared three fin uh, fintech and kind of uh, use cases to clarify the definition because we think there's no clear definition yet about open finance. So. Kuhn, take it away. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Kuhn Terwal. I work with the Dutch Central Bank. And uh, I work in supervisory policy, mainly working on, on tech-related issues. Um, and my link to open finance, why it matters to me, is because uh, along with AFM, we just published yesterday a discussion paper on data mobility in the financial sector, which is basically our first preliminary policy vision of, uh, of how, how we view open finance and data sharing in the, in the financial sector. So very, very pleased to be here today. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Jack Sharp, um, head of business development for Suede Labs. Um, so Suede Labs is, in essence, a regulatory reporting solution, and we help financial institutions fix the, the data problems that they've had over many years, um, in essence, sort of drive a lot more efficiencies and accuracy upstream before um, they deliver the reports to the regulator. Hi, my name is Mirel Terbraak. I work for the um, Authority for Financial Markets in the Netherlands, um, also known as the Conduct Regulator, opposed to the Prudential Regulator and Central Bank. Um, yes, and I'm a policy advisor within the AFM dealing with different kinds of um, innovation-related topics. Good afternoon, Martijn Bols. I am responsible for EU policy at Plaid. Plaid is a uh, global open banking slash open, platform, uh, open finance platform. We currently connect about 12,000 banks to over 6,000 digital financial services apps. So we power millions of people in, in finding a better uh, financial outcome for themselves. Um, we are regulated by the DNB here in the Netherlands and by the uh, FCA in London for account information and payment initiation services. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Abhishek Vivedi, uh, founder of Rexa. Uh, we have been in this space for uh, quite a while now, primarily focused on money laundering detection and investigation. And one of our vision is how we can connect the banks, join hands together for doing it right, so doing the investigations together. So, thank you. Over to you. Okay, thank you for that. 
Um, next, I would like to uh, cover a topic uh, that um, we, we discussed already in the beginning, is that what is your definition of open finance? And then later, we can have uh, more applied use cases and also end stage and vision of, of, uh, of, of this. But uh, first, maybe you can take it away for the, your, yeah, it's a small, I think, it's a, it's a very generic to topic, uh, open finance. What is your... Uh, narrow definition of open finance for your use cases? So what, the way we see open finance in our area is, and, and it's not talked about much, it's about the way we see it is how banks can share information among one another. And, and that, in, of course, the how part we can go in detail, but it's all about, let's say, giving a very practical use case. You have customers who have accounts everywhere. Even criminals have accounts everywhere. How can banks share anonymous information among each other to give that holistic view across the board? So if someone has an account at ING, ABN, and whatnot, how can banks share this piece of information? So our use case relates more about banks sharing the information for the better, better good or greater good, in a way. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, so our definition is slightly different as most of our work pertains a little bit more to the consumer outcomes related to, to open finance. And when we look at the definitions, I think we have two sort of subsets. One is more immediate term when we look at PSD2's evolution, PSD3 expanding the scope of account access, and then one which is a slightly more longer term, which is how do we include cross-sectoral data into the financial sector and how can we use that data to come to an outcome uh, for consumers. So that's hopefully where we hope to land uh, down the line. Okay. Um, yeah, Jack, go ahead. Um, so I guess we're also slightly different uh, in the sense that we're quite focused on the open relationship between financial institutions and the regulators. Um, so for Sway, that really revolves around not our solution, but the open source data standard that we started with a grant from the European Commission in 2014. Um, so what we're really trying to do there is harmonize data, uh, both within financial institutions across their departments, but then across financial institutions, um, and be able to adopt that for all financial institutions, but also the regulator adopting that as well. Um, so the idea being, and the benefits of that, are that there's a far more collaborative um, wisdom of the community aspect to registry reporting. Uh, we often say that there's, there's really no competitive advantage of doing regulatory reports better. We're really just trying to get the reports out the door, make sure that the, you know, the industry is stable. Um, and so we're really just driving to, to make sure that that happens in a much more efficient way, given the, the high total cost of ownership for the whole industry at the moment. I think it's at about 20 billion, which is just far too much. Yeah, I mean, our definition of open finance, I think, I think we've heard different elements here that are all really important. So it's more consumer-centric, giving consumers essentially the ability to, to, to share data. And in our view, that's, that goes beyond just sort of traditional financial data. More and more, of course, non-traditional data is becoming important in financial services. So I think our definition of, of, of what open finance is, is sort of, um, you know, the ability to share data that is relevant for, uh, for, for the delivery of financial services, and that can also include you know, sharing between institutions, and it can also indeed, uh, indeed include uh, sharing with the regulator. So I think what we've heard here is a pretty broad definition with different, different angles, and that's, that's how we would see it as well. Yeah, and maybe just a small addition from a policy perspective, because there are pretty, well, there are a lot of different developments going on at the European Commission at the moment. So we talk about open finance and um, the financial silo of the European Commission is thinking of an open finance proposal. But on the other hand, uh, different parts of the European Commission also thinking about the data and actually pub publishing um, initiatives may be known to you as well um, on data. And in, in the paper, um, Kuhn talked about, um, we try to link our thoughts on uh, data in the financial industry, also to the other sorts of data that can be in interesting and add this element of reciprocity uh, to it. So the broader initiatives I refer to are, for instance, the Data Act, but also the, Di um, the Digital Markets Act, Digital Service Act, those sorts of uh, regulations uh, in the EU right now. 
Okay, thank you for those um, definitions. Um, what we have done is we've prepared um, three um, um, kind of waves of, of um, how to apply this as in a use case. First, we have the retail sector. Uh, next, we uh, can have a look uh, from this uh, per uh, yeah, perceived uh, definitions towards uh, a database set. And the next is from uh, wholesale banking or wholesale uh, point of view from uh, wholesale to regulator. So first we're gonna start with the retail market and that's also for you as an audience to actually see that uh, there's a different applied uh, use case to a very broad topic. And for this we wanna have some clarity to you how to actually look for this as uh, challenges and also to look at your uh, uh, scaling up or to your creating a value with, with this. Uh, so. For retail market, um, we can start for this now as a use case. Thank you. I think I'm the only one with the B2C component here. Well, actually, our business is mainly B2B, but our clients are all uh, sort of in the retail space. So as such, we have a keen interest in the, the data sources that we can that we can pull from, uh, from for uh, for our solutions. And right now, we're looking at you know the PSD2 mandate, which is current accounts and sometimes a savings account if it doesn't have a fixed counter account, right? And that's just simply not enough to enable all of the, all of the use cases that, that, that we could do with, from a technological perspective. I mean, we're really looking at taking information from mortgage account, accounts, utilities accounts, investment accounts, um, even, you know, sort of car insurance accounts that we, that we can link to your day-to-day your -day spending with and sort of determine what kind of a driver you might be, right? So that's something that we're really looking at moving towards in an open finance perspective. And that's where I think for us the really interesting part of this conversation starts, which, which is the cross-sectoral data, uh, data right. So uh, yesterday during the prep, you, you said something very interesting, sort of assigning the property right of the data that's generated by the user to the user themselves, right? So that's really looking at data that's been generated by an IoT device, could be your fridge, could be your car, and then that's your, your data that you can use as you see fit. And what that also means is that you could move that to a TPP such as Plaid that can help connect that with your current account or your financial information and your financial behavior to come to a really hyper-personalized outcome in a way that we haven't seen before. But in order to do that, we need to have a lot of different sectors working together in a very interoperable manner. And I think that's something that, that we're advocating for very strongly because we really do see the consumer benefit that comes out of that. Okay, thank you. Um, we can have a discussion later on uh, how we actually uh, see the trust or the, the audience that actually, or the, sorry, the, the, the consumers can actually are allowed to give it, but they're not really willing to share it. So that's for discussion later also from the audience. But let's do it case by case, and we can have the next one from, uh, from a database uh, point of view then. Um. So yeah, I guess uh, from our perspective, as I said, the, the vision is, is more so within uh, the relationship between financial institutions and regulators. Um, and it's kind of already started, so <clears throat> excuse me. Um, for that, there's been a lot of feasibility assessments. I'm not sure if the, the DMB have done it. Um, they released a, a paper, obviously, but the, the BaFin and the PRA have released sort of feasibility assessments about um, this sort of futuristic supervision, digital supervision. Uh, and what that looks like is that there's far more open architecture between financial institutions uh, and the reg regulator. Uh, the ability to sort of push or pull um, more granular data rather than looking at, you know, report level data, which has been seen to be just very unsustainable, you know, with crypto coming in, with the pandemic, etc. more and more regulatory requirements um, are needed and are imposed on uh, financial institutions, and it's already too much of a burden for both them and the regulators to then digest and, and make sure it's accurate. So um, being able to apply a common data standard, common definitions where financial institutions can define their data, uh, can really talk to each other, uh, collaborate, understand, um, and reduce that heavy need of interpreting what the regulator is saying to them and what they're making them do will just drive huge amounts of efficiencies um, and will reduce the whole sort of total cost of ownership. So the vision that we, we like to look at is a little bit, uh, you know, into the future, very sort of Star Wars-esque, but the regulator having, uh, I guess, a, an open dashboard 
um, which is almost near real time, and they're just consuming all the data from the financial institutions. It's all standardized. Uh, they're doing the calculations themselves and taking that burden off the institution um, and getting you know, almost close real time just understandings of the most important ratios, metrics, um, that they can then act on um, fast and ensure you know, a more stable ecosystem. So uh, that's the vision. Um, things have already started uh, to come into play to sort of help towards that. We've been working with regulators to help inform their data strategy based off you know, our expertise with uh, our particular clients. And um, yeah, it's proven to be quite extensible, which is uh, always promising. And we've been able to move into d new jurisdictions and still maintain that level of uh, granularity within the, the data standard. Okay, thanks. Next, um, from, from your side. Uh, our side is a bit more unconventional. When you talk about banks sharing the data among each other, then it becomes, oh, our trade secrets are out. So something, and, and hence I would like to even narrow down the business case further into for the greater good, in a sense, you do need to share information from the financial institution's perspective, either you are an insurance provider or you are a bank and so on. If there is some sort of investigation, you would like to know what this entity, this company, this person has been doing across the board. Because when we talk about money laundering and terrorism financing, these guys are smart. They don't go to just one bank or just one uh, re real estate developer to launder their funds. They do it across the board. So getting that connectivity and allowing the opportunity to share the data, and of course it can be anonymized again, uh, let's not go on the how part, but once that data sharing does happen, that kind of open finance end state will help the society in a bigger way because everyone can act, or when I say everyone, it's about the financial institutions. They will have the same level of information and their judgment can be calculated. That, hey, I have 100% information and hence I do such and such for this customer, so and so. So that's our vision, how data sharing among these institutions can enable better judgment, finding criminals in a much more uh, predictable way, if that makes sense. So basically, you're saying that um, I think for everyone, uh, instead of a closed mindset, we have to open up our mindset and we have to think about opening up data, but also collaboration and working amongst each other, um, which will create value for the whole ecosystem. So now, that's also, I think the, the, the best thing why we are using in this use case, because people can learn from each other while working together. So it's about resources, it's about knowledge, it's about yeah, science even, that, that you can also work together. So you have to open up your business model and from a closed business model to an open business model, I would say, where you create value within the ecosystem. And I think that is very key, I think. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, um, I think, for, yeah, go ahead, Kun, yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think so. Basically, what we're hearing is 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 as you said, it's sort of a um, a switch from data that is closed, that is siloed, uh, towards data that can be shared and can be used uh, more readily. And I think that's that's sort of the overall the overarching theme of, of open finance. Um, if I look at the, the customer centric use case, let's say, where I think you made a couple of important points, Martin. You said, well, first of all, it's not just about financial data, but we need to look beyond financial data, right? We need to look at IoT data or big tech data or whatever it may be that is becoming more relevant and consumers should be able to, to own that and, 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 and control it. And in the, 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 the paper that, we've, that we published yesterday, and by the way, I would just urge everybody to, to read it and, uh, and respond, of course. Um, I think we're, what we're saying is, is it's the same thing. So Mirel, of course, mentioned there's a, a lot of different pieces of regulation sort of floating around Brussels now that open up uh, the ability for consumers to, to share their data. Um, but what we're saying is we need to really look at that holistically. In the short term, of course, there will be different bits and pieces of regulation, open finance for financial data, IoT data, that's covered by a different uh, piece of, re of regulation. But we do believe in the longer term we should move towards uh, interoperability or reciprocity, basically having a single piece of regulation that allows consumers to share their data more broadly. But with that, with, with enhanced data sharing also, in our view, comes enhanced responsibility for uh, those entities that receive the data, right? If you're a financial entity and you're able to stream data uh, in real time, 
we believe that just asking for consent is not necessarily going to be enough anymore, right? And, and, and there's going to be a responsibility to think about how do we use the data, what is ethical, what is desirable also from a, you know, from a, from a, from a societal perspective. So I think with the consumer side, what's important is, yes, a greater ability to share data, but also a greater responsibility on those who receive and use, uh, use the data. And I think that's, that would be sort of our, our view on that. If, if I may add something uh, to complement it, we, we have to specify what the data will be used for. So as long as there are proper boundaries in, yes, the data has to be shared, yes, it is going to be used for ABC use cases, I think that will bring some comfort in the wider mass and the community, financial institutions or consumers and so on. However, what we see is, yeah, we have to share the data. And if you just say you have to share the data, everyone becomes uncomfortable. What are you going to use my data for? Are you tracking my every moment, my all purchases, and so on? So if we talk about uh, sharing, there has to be specific boundaries. OK, yes. And, and I say yes, but is always a no. But the, the thing is, you have to limit boundaries. Once you set the boundaries, then you also give confidence to the data owner that your data is being used for such and such purposes. And that's something we have to keep in mind whenever we talk about sharing, if that makes sense. Yeah, can, can I add on to that quickly? I think it, to your point as well, like let there be no doubt that informed consent will always be the basis of, of data sharing. And, and I agree with you that with increased access comes in, increased responsibility. But there's also just sort of a, a data security component there that is going to be risk-based and that's going to be part of being regulated uh, as an entity by, by public authorities, right? So, so we hope to enter into a really constructive dialogue there to find out what are the bandwidths, what are the risks that we can take with the data we have, what kind of data are we collecting, how is that commensurate to the risk we're taking, and most importantly, how do we ensure the safety for the, for the end consumer and ensure that they get, the, um, get the, 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 the outcome that they're hoping for, which is a better financial service, but also increasing their trust overall in data sharing as a vital part of the information economy moving forward. And I think the DMB did already publish a few reports on consumer trust. They weren't too promising, I think, a few years ago. But I, hope, I think those things are changing uh, very much. Um, and we look forward to, I think Mirel wants to jump in. Yeah, yeah I think this is uh, also a topic um, that needs to grow in the longer term, you know, it's not just when launching a proposal, it's a, it, it will be there, you know, so it will take time and um, so will trust. Um, if there's added value in a solution, I, I think customers will come, but, uh, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, working on a commercial side, I'm a, I'm a supervisor. I think to add on what we find important is that it's not just a simple check of, oh, a person has given consent. It goes much further. The responsibility has been explained, but also how can that be arranged? So in the paper, we share some ideas of how that can be uh, arranged so that linkages need to be made between the GDPR, but also financial regulation, because we... Um, have certain important principles and rules in our regulation about, for instance, the duty of care, but also uh, the whole uh, product governance process a company needs to go through in developing a new product. And if data is becoming more uh, important, in and I can imagine it's becoming more important if you want to fine tune um, the product to, to your customer base or identify which customers will use it and so forth. Um, I think um, we need to try to um, have the right checks and balances uh, in place on the data component in these processes. Um, yeah, anything to add? Or I agree with, with Mirel, <laughs> of course. Uh, um, and I, I just like to, to get back perhaps very briefly to what, what, what James said, which is uh, you know more on the on the how do regulators use data and how can we sort of you know um, have real time access to to granular data? I think it's a it's a very interesting vision. It's something of course we're working on. There there are tricky things to deal with there, so I think you need to work through those. Um, one other thing that I think is that open finance can actually also help us in terms of supervise, uh, supervision and not just through you know be serving as an impetus for for further data standardization, but also in the paper we suggest. Uh, that, that standardized product information be made available. And that, of course, can help comparison services. It can make the, the, the financial markets more efficient and more transparent. But also it can help us as supervisors 
better understand what type of products are being are, are out there, are being introduced, what the what the developments in the market are. So I, I, I completely agree. I think we can do a lot more with, with data from institutions, but also open finance can be an important uh, impetus uh, for that. Yeah, so what you see is that the learning capability should be high, because I, I know, I remember, I wrote a paper once on, uh, on uh, interoperability, and there you saw that there's no ISO standard, for example. The data from companies is not uh, there to actually work with other APIs. And that's I, some uh, paper I wrote about it, and that's, we have to learn as an industry, we have to see, that's why I think it's good to have a use case on, on these data, but that is, I think, it's, it's why the end state, what is your, your, your view on the horizon of open finance? That's, that's something also we discussed. What is, what is a very clear um, path to go there, I would say? And that's so, uh, and any views on that? What, what is the end state of where we should go? So I guess in terms of the, the end state is sort of discussed in terms of the vision, I guess, of where we would want this to go to between the, the financial institutions, the regulators. I guess the, the key questions and something that I posed to, to Kuhn and uh, Morel kind of uh, meanly, because they probably can't answer, but um, just around that level of error that will be allowed as a cushion as there's a transformation. If you know financial institutions want to uh, get very granular and standardized with their data, if they want to use you know these machine learning automation tools, there's going to be a transition period where you know there's going to be certain amounts of error. And in regulatory reporting, that's you know completely not allowed. We need to have accuracy across the board and it needs to make sure that everything's uh, correct and lines up. So I guess uh, the idea is that, then the question that we would end up posing is that regulatory reports get submitted, you know, monthly, quarterly, biannually. Uh, if we were to do a trade-off between having more regular data uh, being sent to the regulator, but with a higher percentage error, and allowing that to train the machine learning and train the automation to get better at it, uh, would that be allowed? And uh, as I said, probably not one for, for now, but uh, a more philosophical one as we move forward. Um, I think another thing that overarches that, you know, before even talking about that pull architecture, those discussions have been had, but, you know, financial institutions aren't going to be very happy at allowing the regulator to pull data whenever they want and having that open access. So um, defining, you know, when they're allowed to take the data, what data they're allowed to take, and being very strict on that may make financial institutions more open to doing so. Um, but again, that's a sort of a conversation that uh, needs to continue to be had to get to that stage of um, open communication and, uh, and more efficient system. And if I may add, uh, from our use case perspective, where we are thinking banks can talk to each other, share data across each other, of course, the ultimate vision is how you get a customer's holistic view across the industry. So. Uh, no matter which financial institution you are, if you pick a customer, either a company or an individual, you see what they are doing across the board. So that's the ultimate goal. However, in the short term, what will be, let's say, as a vision, is the comfort factor. Are the financial institutions going to be comfortable sharing the data in the first place? So if we cross that barrier in the first place, that will open up a lot of opportunities. And that barrier is sort of a very big barrier, so that has to be broken at some point. So that's where I see one step at a time. Yeah, to add on to that, I think the barrier is not only with financial institutions sharing data, but also people, <laughs> everyone in this room sharing your data for, for your own benefit in a financial services um, relationship. But when you ask about what is the end stage, what's the sort of the final outcome we hope to see, I don't think there is one. It's an evolution that continues over and over again until you know, none of us are, are longer here, but we won't be talking about finance anymore in the future, I think, right? We'll all be absorbed into some sort of data economy that, that works in a sort of reciprocal and, and interoperable way. But for now, as we evolve out of open banking, we have a few really key asks for open finance, and, and I think we've um, sort of elaborated on those, and, and hopefully we can find common ground between regulators, the market, and then also, of course, all the people who need to participate uh, in that. Yeah, so then the... the um then you see the, the society will be a stakeholder whereby the, the market has to educate the people yeah. so they can see the, the trust. They will give you the trust exactly. and you will have transparency over the data yeah. and there's no rogue um, um, 
things going on. And, yeah, exactly. And so information more, so. security standards are really key. So you have to key. educate the, mm -hmm. the, the people. That's Absolutely. always the, the, the yeah, key, always of course. The key, yeah. Yeah. They don't know that they want it until they want it. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's our job. Yeah. So it adds value for society as well. So Correct. Yeah. Not only for the, the, the incumbents, but also the, the fintech. But society as a stakeholder needs to have the value then and see what, why they have to share or Absolutely. can share the yeah, data. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And then that's for another conversation perhaps, but that also ties into sort of marginalized communities that from a financial inclusion perspective, you open a lot more doors for people who've been traditionally underserved and you, you really do do a lot of societal good with that, so. Exactly, yeah. Any other views? Yeah. No, uh, yeah. Go ahead. No, maybe, maybe you, I was just wondering if there were any questions also from the audience, it might, might be good to involve them, but, but you go first. Thank you. Um, I, have a, I have a question, actually, and, and it, it is about the terminology here. Uh, we are talking about open finance, right? So I am actually an engineer. I'm uh, the founder of Dusk Network. Um, when I'm, when I'm in engineeristic term, I'm thinking about openness. Uh, I'm thinking about composability. I'm thinking about, you know, data not, not only data, actually, but process that compose with each other. And I'm, th I'm thinking about basically the openness of a certain, of a certain systems. Uh, what I have been hearing from you guys is basically terminology that always, that kind of worries me a little bit because uh, it seems like your uh, conversation cent is centered around data sharing, is centered around customers and businesses. Um, when I am thinking about open finance instead, I am, or an open whatever, I'm, in this case finance, I think it's uh, one of the most interesting um, of all the arguments. I'm actually thinking more in terms of protocols rather than services. I'm thinking more in terms of self-sovereignty rather than basically sharing data. I'm thinking more about the capability of actually prevent measurements that have got to do with law enforcement with automation. This is what open seems to me. So I wanted to ask, uh, to ask you uh, if essentially where do you see um, a role of an open protocol in uh, uh, an open finance context? Also from the perspective that no consumer ever wants to share anything and which is something that uh, it is needed by, by, you know, businesses more than consumers. Well, maybe next time we should invite some engineers. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think in the paper there's also a little bit about infrastructure, APIs, and uh, how, to, how, how to work with, with, with that. But um, I have to admit it's more about, uh, to, at least from my perspective, or perhaps also Kuhn, it's, it's more about, um, well, the policy part of it. Um, but there's a few notes on infrastructure that, that, that are interesting, but I'm not really happy, well, I'm not really comfortable talking about it because I'm not an engineer. So then we really need to invite others as well. Martijn, do you want to? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I couldn't hear all of it, so I, I must apologize. I think that um, if you're talking about, well, we're, we're not just talking about, you know, data sharing, et cetera, between consumers, business, et cetera. Yes, there has to be an overarching framework, I suppose, that actually enables data to, to, to be shared or data to be, to be exchanged. Um, that, that is absolutely true, and I think that's, that's a big part of the regulatory uh, discussion is going to be how can we actually make sure that we're not just dealing with silos that are sort of held by certain entities, but that you can actually be, I think you mentioned the word sovereignty and data sovereignty, that actually the, the data owner, the, data, the person who generates the data is actually sovereign in terms of who the data is shared with or is not shared with, right? So there has to be the, the opportunity to sort of to share if you want and to not share if you don't want. I think the only, the, the additional thing that, that we're talking about in our paper as well is meaningful data sovereignty. People talk a lot about data sovereignty, meaning me or, or you or anybody else here somehow has, has perfect uh, ability to share or not to share. And we all know that that's not how it, how it really works, that, that individuals find it difficult to anticipate what the impact is going to be if I share data. 
And that sometimes triggers an attitude of, I don't want to share anything. I just want to go, you know. So what, what we're saying, and that's where I think the, um, the aspect of additional responsibility comes from, is to say, okay, if somebody chooses to share their data, that doesn't relieve the person or the entity receiving the data from their responsibility to think about what is ethical, what, what is in the interest of this person. And again, you cannot do that at an individual level as a company or as a bank or as an insurance company perhaps, but you can do it at least, we say, in terms of, in, in terms of putting in place processes about how do we deal with data, how do, what data do we use, what don't we use. So that's what I mean by, uh, so I think our concept is more of one of meaningful data sovereignty. Um, and I'm not sure if that answers the question, but uh, maybe we can talk about it afterwards as well. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Anyone? It's been so clear. Yeah. If not, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, if not, thank you very much, uh, panel, for uh, uh, this uh, discussing uh, this all with uh, under your supervision, uh, Ernst Jan. Um, and I think this is the end of the session then uh, for you. Uh, I don't have any questions for you actually either. Uh, so, are there, if there are really no questions from the audience, then uh, I think uh, the session is over and we will come back at 3 o'clock with platformification and the customer demands. Thank you very much. <laughs>